Thank you very much, Nicholas, for that, for that introduction and for reminding us of what Temenos Academy uh, is in existence uh, to, to do. Well, some of you may have been at the very interesting talk on Burma, which Kevin Fisher gave for Temenos uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, and it can be found in the new Temenos Academy Review, incidentally, which has just come out. That talk focused on Burma's relationship to Blake, and in particular with respect to the imagination. So I'm not going to say very much about those subjects tonight, but instead I'm going to concentrate on Burma's understanding of the will and its relationship to final reality. This is what is absolutely central to Burma. And let me begin with words with which he opens one of his books. These are his words. We have written this work not for the irrational animals who in their exterior have the form of man, but in their image, in spirit, are evil wild beasts, which is disclosed and exhibited by their properties but for the image of man, for those who are budding forth out of the animal image with a human image and that belongs to God's kingdom and would fain live and grow in the human image, in the right man. The human image, the right man. Dangerous. The human image, the right man. That is what Jakob Burma. That is what Jakob Burma wanted to find, wanted to find and restore. He lived from 1575 to 1624, and is of course famous as one of the great German mystical thinkers. He believed that God, ultimate reality, is essentially will and he is often seen as the founder of German philosophical voluntarism. He sought to understand how this will is reflected in the world, where good and evil seem to be inextricably mixed together. And he sought to do so in such a way as to bring about a profound change in self-understanding, in the, in the, in the self-understanding, in the very being of men and women, those half-dead angels, as he called them. My writing is only to this end, he declares, that man might learn to know what he is and what he was in the beginning. Burma lived for almost all his life in the old town of Görlitz, a little to the east of Dresden and north of Prague. It's now on the German-Polish border but at that time it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Like others at that time, he was intensely aware of the conflict and strife around him as the Christian world broke apart into fiercely competing factions. The Thirty Years' War, which would devastate Europe, began some six years before Burma's death. He was part philosopher, part religious mystic, and he earned his living by making shoes. He was neither poor nor rich, a shoemaker, a diligent and reasonably, and reasonably successful artisan and trader. The house he lived in is still, the house he lived in is still preserved in Görlitz, and as you'll notice, it seems to have had a fresh coat of paint since the collapse of East Germany and you can see the commemorative plaque on the wall. This is Burma as he was in midlife. It's taken from a later edition of one of his books. From boyhood, he had had remarkable experiences in which he became aware of a different level of reality lying just below the surface of the world. In his first book, The Aurora, or Dawn, he relates the following. I fell into a great melancholy and sadness when I beheld the, 
when I beheld the mighty deep of this world. For I saw evil and good, love and anger in all things, in the earth and in its elements, as well as in man and beast. In this affliction, I wrapped up my whole heart and soul, together with my thought and will, in the resolution to struggle with the love and mercy of God without ceasing until he blessed me. And when I stormed so hard on God and all the gates of hell, as if my life depended on it, and I had still some reserves of strength, suddenly, at a violent assault, my spirit burst through the gates into the innermost birth of deity. And there I was embraced with love, as a bridegroom embraces his bride. It was like the resurrection from the dead. In this light, my spirit saw through all things and into all creatures, and I recognized God in grass and plants. As we see here, Burma was in some respects a nature mystic, but he was also a, but he was also a sincere Lutheran. He regularly attended the Lutheran church in Görlitz, but his insights did not fit easily into that framework, and throughout his life he was fiercely opposed and persecuted by his pastor, a man named Gregorius Richter, who reacted to the publication of Burma's Aurora with these words. There are as many blasphemies in this shoemaker's book as there are lines. It smells of shoemaker's pitch and filthy blacking. May this unsufferable stench be far from us. The Aryan poison was not so deadly as this shoemaker's poison. Well, in a way, Richter had a point, because some of Burma's ideas certainly challenged Lutheran doctrine, and sometimes Christian teaching as a whole. He did not accept the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, sola fide, nor the teaching that the creation of man was ex nihilo, out of nothing. God, for him, is very far from being an unmoved mover, a changeless reality standing apart from the world and apart from the human soul and creating these from nothing. This is another picture of Burma, obviously Sorry, I think we've gone slightly wrong here. Um, ah, that's better. This is another picture of Burma, obviously late in life. It may have been done in his last year when he visited Dresden as the guest of some of the principal men of the city. That this should have happened is remarkable, for Burma's education was that of the artisan class and very limited and the obscurity of much of his writing is said to result from this. Nevertheless, he must have been of high intelligence, for he assimilated a good deal of the knowledge of his time. He was familiar with the ideas of earlier mystically inclined Protestant thinkers, notably Valentin Weigel, and with the naturo-philosophical traditions of Central Europe, going back to Paracelsus and beyond. As a young man, he wandered over Germany for two or three years. We don't really know what he did. But, but he was wandering about perhaps in the spirit of Paracelsus, who had written, so a doctor must seek out old wives, gypsies, sorcerers, wandering tribes, old robbers and such outlaws, and take lessons from them. Knowledge is experience. Although not, so far as we know, a practicing alchemist, Burma is clearly familiar with its language and often makes use of its symbolism. The city of Prague was less than 100 miles from Görlitz, and here, at the court of the Habsburg Emperor Rudolf II, 
The knowledge of the age, and notably the practice of alchemy and astrology, was centred. This may help to explain the support Burma received from men far above him in social status during his long conflict with the Lutheran Church, which, even at the end of his life, gave him a Christian burial only with the greatest reluctance. But it would be a mistake to think of Burma's ideas as the result of alchemical or other influences. As we have seen, his ideas sprang from the depths of his inner experience, and he is above all an original thinker. He would not have thought of himself as a philosopher, but he was of immense importance for German thought. Hegel called him the first German philosopher. And in Burma's writings, we can find the seeds of Kant's interest in the subjective element in perception, of Hegel's dialectic of thesis, antithesis, and, and synthesis, and of Schopenhauer's conception of the metaphysical will. Schopenhauer writes of Burma's noble and splendid words and places him, along with the Upanishads, Plotinus, Scotus Eregina, and the Sufi poets, as a source of the highest knowledge to which mankind can attain. In England, translations started to appear within 25 years of Burma's death, notably those of John Sparrow and John Elliston, published in London during the time of Cromwell. These are the translations I'm using tonight, since they best preserve the rough energy with which Burma writes. As Sparrow notes, so that those excellent notions might not be slipped over as men do in common current English, but that the strangeness of the words may make them a little stay and consider what the meaning may be. The question driving Burma and giving his writings their urgency and dramatic power is one which had long haunted Christianity, the problem of evil. How could a loving God have made the world we live in so full of strife and suffering, where blind impersonal forces seem to prevail? Because of his limited education, the struggles of the theologians were of no help to him. I can do nothing, he writes, with their methods and their formulas, since I have not studied them. I have another master, and that is all of nature. In nature and its creative force, I have studied and learned my philosophy, my astrology, and my theology, not through the mediation of men. Nature and its creative force. That is the center around which Burma's thought revolves. Unlike many other mystics, his starting point is not transcendent reality or a creator God, but the world we live in and the way in which it can be transformed by a change in our own being. It was in this world that he had seen the veil of matter grow thin to reveal the divinity shining through beneath it. But human beings had lost contact with their own divinity. They are half-dead angels. Paradise is still on earth, he writes in the signature of all things, but man is far away from it. Burma believed that ideally, the ultimate mystery, the origin of things, should not be inquired into at all. It lies too far beyond our ken. And yet, since sin has now arisen, we must know how it arose, or we cannot discover the remedy. We have to find out, he writes, from whence and by what means evil is come to be in the devils and in man and in all creatures, 
For such untowardness is found to be in all creatures, biting, tearing, worrying, and hurting one another. Everything is so at odds with itself. As we see it to be, not only in the living creatures, but also in the stars, elements, earth, stones, metals, in wood, leaves, and grass. All of nature was alive, driven by some inner creative power. But the result of this ceaseless activity, this mercurial wheel of nature, as he calls it, is often conflict and suffering. Therefore, Burma concludes, we have no alternative. We must open the mystery of the process of manifestation and find for ourselves why this is so. And it is possible for us to do this. As we have come out of the divine, we can penetrate back into it. For every spirit, as he puts it, can seek back into its mother. Underlying nature and its creative force is what Burma speaks of as the ungrund, that is to say, the groundless, the non-being, that beyond which there is and can be nothing else. He calls it the abyss out of which all issues. Here, God, in his ultimate nature, is the eternal silence, the all and the nothing, neither darkness nor light, manifest to none, not even to himself. Burma writes, he is not this and not that, neither evil nor good, love nor anger. It cannot be said of God that he has distinction in himself, for he is in himself natureless, emotionless, creatureless. The Ungrund is the primordial condition which precedes being. It is therefore without substance, nature, or qualities of any sort. In this initial stage, the divine is the eternal nothing, the still rest, the repose without being, die stille ohne Wesen. There is no existence, and we are reminded of the absolute God of negative mysticism, of the not this, not this of the Upanishads, and of Eckhart's, if there were a God of whom I had any idea, it would not be worth having him as God. Yet we see at this point how different Burma is from the earlier mystics in the Western tradition. For the Ungrund does not satisfy Burma. It may be the ultimate truth, yes, but from the standpoint of the world we are in, it is of little use. It tells us nothing about manifestation or the arising of evil. That which is without nature profits me nothing I could to all eternity neither feel nor see nor understand it, he writes. He is convinced that nothing can be explained out of an absolute unity. Manifestation lies before us. It is a fact. And for manifestation to come into being, there must be difference. A second and contrary principle must be present. If the abyss, the ungrund, is the source and cause of everything, Burma argues, it follows that within its essence there must lie, if only in latent and potential form, some plurality, 
some dark source of difference from which a beginning can be produced. <clears throat> God, in his ultimate nature, cannot be a static perfection, as theology teaches. For out of, the absolute un for out of an absolute unity, no multiplicity can come. There must lie within God some seed of differentiation, not only a yes, but also a no. He writes, The reader must know that all things, whether godly, devilish, earthly, or whatsoever it may be called, consist in yes or no. The one, as the yes, is pure virtue and life, and is the truth of God, or God himself. But God would be unknowable to himself, and would have in himself no joy, perception, or exaltation without the no. The no is the opposite to the yes, or the truth. In order that the truth may be manifest as a something, there must be a contrary therein. <clears throat> Thus Burma concludes that the basis of all things, the ungrund or abyss, is not a static perfection, not a principle of pure transcendence, but a being or power, a will, which is full of movement and energies, in which the countries of good and evil are already contained in principle, though not yet in actuality. It is important to understand that this is not will in the limited sense in which we know it in ourselves. That's merely the tip of the iceberg. It is will in the sense of cosmic life force, the creative principle of the universe. The essence even of inanimate nature, as the alchemists maintained. Everything in nature is alive, or at least has life locked within it. Even the rocks, Burma thought, are a kind of willing. All things are generated out of will, he writes. For will is the master of every work. It has its origin out of God the Father towards nature and passes through nature back to his heart, which is the end of nature. In short, God is that will which flowing outward manifests as nature, but may then be transformed and rise again out of nature and return to the heart of unmanifested being. Thus there are, in effect, two wills, two directions, as we shall see shortly. And so we find that ultimate reality is for Burma a dynamic, ever-changing process. The world is simply will, in a manifested and materialized form. He writes, the coming into being of the whole creation is nothing else but a manifestation of the all essential, unsearchable God. All things are sprung forth out of the divine desire and created into an essence or state of being. As the formless will, which is the ungrund or abyss, starts to come into manifestation, it begins to take on form and shapes. And these ideal forms, and these ideal forms from which all later forms are born, are personified by Burma as a female figure. He calls her die Jungfrau der Weisheit the virgin wisdom. 
This celestial maiden was vividly real for Burma and is the expression of a profound and ancient philosophical idea, that of Sophia, or wisdom, the archetypal pattern out of which all forms emerge. The idea, of course, is prominent in Plato, in the shape of the ideas. It is present in the Logos of the Stoics and of St. John's Gospel, and was expressed in the naming of the great church at Constantinople, Aya Sophia, the Holy Wisdom. But centuries before this, it is already present in the Old Testament, and in the book of Proverbs, wisdom speaks as follows. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. For Burma, the virgin wisdom, or Sophia, held within her being the meaning and purpose of the universe. She was the key to recovering the lost state of bliss, and she awakened in him the most powerful emotion. The Virgin has given me her promise, he writes, not to leave me in my need. I will go through thorns and thistles, through scorn and disgrace, till I come again to my own native country, out of which my soul has wandered, where my dear Virgin dwells. <clears throat> I rely upon the promise she made to me when she appeared to me, that she would turn my sorrow into joy. As I lay upon the mountain at midnight and all the trees fell over me and the storm beat upon me and Antichrist opened wide his jaws to devour me, she came and comforted me and wedded herself to me. Just as the Virgin Mary or the child Jesus. So it is the Virgin Sophia who will bear the new man. Out of the same virginity from which Christ was born, must we all be born, he writes. And the same conception is applied to the cosmos as a whole. As the unformed energy or will, which is the ungrund, stirs into life, it enters into and impregnates the Virgin, who is the wisdom or shaping power of God, and it is she who gives it form. Out of this primordial union of form or idea on the one hand, and energy or will on the other, the world comes into being. The visible world, Burma writes, is the symbol of the spiritual, invisible world. This world is an image of the divine essence and is God, revealed through an earthly image. The admission of a duality already contained, at least in principle, in the ultimate reality, enables Burma to explain the presence of evil and pain in the world in terms that seemed more convincing than Christian theism, than Christian theism can offer. He sees that without evil, there could be and would be no good, just as without shadow, no light can be seen. That imperfection, and hence evil and suffering, is in fact the very condition of manifestation. Ona qual can keine offenbaren sein, he writes. Without pain, no manifestation can be. For there can be no, for there can be no manifestation without difference. And difference implies that there must be some imperfection. Hence, 
a manifested world is necessarily an imperfect world, containing things which are good and things which are less good, and hence bad. To complain that the world is imperfect is simply to say that it is not the unmanifested ultimate reality. If everything were perfection, how could there be light and shade, good and bad, high and low? Everything would rest in the primordial state. If God is to be known or to know himself, manifestation and with it grades of being, good and bad, joy and suffering, is indispensable. The desire to good, Burma writes, and the desire to evil, both must be, or God would not be manifested. Nothing in nature is to be rejected, or all would be a still nothing. God can come into manifestation only through a contrary, an opposite principle in himself. Burma put it in memorable words, without poison there can be no life. And so, like some Gnostic thinkers centuries before him, Burma comes to the conclusion that there are two wills. But they are not, as the Manichaeans thought, two opposed principles of being, one good and one evil, forever in strife. Both wills are God, just as we find both wills in ourselves. There is a dark will and a light will. The dark will is what he calls the nature will, painful, restricted, greedy, asserting itself. It is the outward going will, the will to manifestation. He writes of tearing oneself away from the will of God. Using Christian terminology, no wonder his Lutheran pastor was shocked. He calls this outward going will the Father, the light will opposing it and leading to, re and leading to reintegration with the divinity, he calls the Son. In his book, The Signature of All Things, Burma writes, the being of all beings, that is to say God, is but one only being. But in its generation or manifestation, it separates itself into two principles, into darkness and light, into sorrow and joy, into evil and good, into anger and love, into fire and light. Is the source of suffering and evil, therefore, to be found in God himself, in the very nature of ultimate reality? Burma thinks of himself at all times as a Christian, and although he comes perilous, perilously close to admitting that it does, he just manages to avoid this. He does so by arguing, perhaps a little speciously, that good and evil lie in God, but only in potential, as possibilities, and not as actualities. They have not yet separated. They are not yet good and evil, but an equilibrium of mutually opposed yet complementary forces held together in harmony. They are not yet kindled, as Burma puts it, not made actual. They become actual only in the process of manifestation. Burma calls these two fundamental principles of divine being, without which there could be no world, the anger and the love of God. The anger is what he calls the first principle. 
Here the love and light of God are hidden. It is the outgoing will which moves away from the initial unity. The will in all existence to assert and preserve separate, inter separate independent being. But the will of life, he writes, broke itself away from the divine essence and went into experience and perception. Out of unity and into multiplicity and resisted the unity which was the eternal rest and only good. The anger then is the destruction of the primordial unity and leads into what Burma calls the dark world, the world of strife and struggle, of unredeemed nature, of blind struggle in the darkness of ignorance. The second principle is the will which is opposed to this, the will to return to the initial unity after having passed through what Burma calls, what Burma calls the beast-like will of the self and turned away from it. It is the ingoing will. He calls it God's love and sees it in terms of light flowing both from and towards God. It is a total turning away from the assertion of separateness, individuality, and selfishness. The assumption of a new identity. Here, Burma says, the light is manifest and the darkness and anger hidden. This opposition of the two wills in the being of God also takes place in the human soul. For the soul is, in fact, in Burma's words, God's own substance. It is not a kind of being different from God, he says. But on the contrary, it is fundamentally the divine substance itself. And, endowed with its own primordial freedom, it brings into reality the latent and possible opposition between good and evil. Burma writes, the inner essence of the soul is the divine nature and is neither evil nor good. But in the kindled life of the soul, the same will divides itself. It is itself its own cause to good and evil. For it is the center of God where God's love and anger are latent and undeveloped in one essence. In this sense, mankind is the center of nature, where light and darkness divide. And Burma cries, Understand, he is no separated spark, like a part from the whole. He is no part, but the whole altogether. It is important to grasp that the second principle, the ingoing will, is not a different world, but a change in the way in which we see and experience the world. And behind this lies a distinction which was important to Burma between two different mental faculties. As a man has two eyes with which to perceive spatial depth, so he has two modes of knowledge, one to see the surface of the world and the other to pierce below it. These two different modes of knowing are reason, the German word is Vernunft, and understanding, or Verstand. At first sight they might, <clears throat> at first sight, they might seem almost the same thing, but Burma saw in them a difference of the first importance. Reason or Vernunft for Burma is that power of thought which is capable of analysis, information processing, problem solving, mathematics, logic. The word reason 
derives from the Latin verb reri, to count, and ratio was originally the faculty of counting. So it is conceptual thought, seen as a more or less mechanical brain function. It was exclusively on reasoning of this type that Descartes, a few years after Burma, built up his new system of knowledge. It is, of course, immensely useful in relation to the world, but Burma writes it comprehends nothing of the kingdom of God but the husk. It is restless and always goes round in a circle on the outside of things. It gives us only external dead nature, not the movement within nature, the spirit, the life of the will. It provides a partial truth and therefore a superficial truth. And when cut off from the understanding, it leads to evil. On the other hand, the understanding is the faculty which grasps meaning and values. It is concerned not with logical connections, but with what things are in themselves. It is the power of choosing, which in medieval philosophy was referred to as the intellect. It seeks the underlying reality beneath the external appearance. Thus, Burma sees the world in terms of outer shell and inner being. The whole outward visible world with all its being, with all its beings, he writes, is a signature or figure of the inward spiritual world. Both reason and understanding, then, are ways of apprehending the world, but they give us very different worlds. This double vision gives to Burma's world a depth of meaning and a tense dramatic interest not possible to either faculty alone. When God reveals himself to man, he writes, then is he in two kingdoms and sees with twofold eyes. And closely linked to the idea of the understanding was another important idea, that of the imagination. It can be traced back to the thinkers of the Islamic world and to Paracelsus, who spoke of it as the astrum or star in man. It is almost the same power as the understanding. But while the understanding is conceived as passive, the imagination is active. It is the creative force in which spiritual insight shapes the world we experience. Only when this happens and the world is known in its inward meaning, Burma tells us, can we escape the struggling nature world and approach the light and bliss of the second principle. Between the pain of the own will and of unredeemed nature known to reason and the bliss of the inward going or reconceived will glimpsed by understanding lies the life of the soul and the present world of good and evil mixed. This is what Burma calls the third principle, where the two wills, the yes and the no of God, contend. This is where the battle rages, and Burma speaks of it as fire. It is both God's anger fire and God's love fire. Simultaneously, the source of burning pain and of light and hope. Man was placed, Burma writes, between the kingdoms of light and darkness, free to choose. So he lives in two principles, he writes, both of which draw him and desire to have him. In the first principle, or source, whose origin is the darkness of the abyss 
and in the divine power or, or virtue whose source is the light and the divine joy in the burst open gates of heaven. Thus is man drawn to both and held by both. But in him stands the center which holds the balance between the two wills, the original will and the reconceived will, and the reconceived will to the kingdom of heaven. For the mind is the center of the scales. The thoughts are the weights that pass out of one scale and into the other. For the one scale is the kingdom of the fierceness and of anger, and the other is the regeneration in the heaven. Thus men and women may choose the own will or the resigned will. The first, he writes, tears itself from the entire will of God and brings itself into selfhood where there is no rest. With the second, man becomes the image of God again, for his will falls back into the unsearchable will of God out of which he came in the beginning. In another place he adds, let each one heed what he does. Each man is his own God and also his own devil. As he inclines to or gives himself unto either of these principles, the same impels and leads him and becomes his master. One of the things which makes Burma difficult for us today is the fact that he uses alchemical imagery to describe the movements of the will. There is no doubt that it was intensely meaningful to him. It is found throughout his writings and takes the shape of what he calls the seven nature forms. These nature forms describe the inner working of the three principles and reflect both the teachings of alchemy and the astrological forces emanating from the seven planets. Three nature forms constitute the dark world of the first principle, the anger of God. Three more form the second principle, the light world, which is the love of God. And between them, a single nature form corresponds to the third principle, the present world. In the first principle, the nature forms which compose it clash, struggle, coagulate, and alter one another, as does sulfur, salt, and quicksilver in the alchemist's retort. All is at the mercy of the impersonal forces of nature. It is the struggling nature world, known to reason, vernunft. It's interesting that we may find a last vestige of this thinking in Goethe's novel, Elective Affinities. Here, in a key passage in the fourth chapter, chemical imagery is used to describe the unrelenting forces drawing the protagonists together or driving them apart. How they attract, seize, destroy, devour, and absorb each other, in Goethe's words. The second principle contains the mirror image of this. The process is reversed as the understanding comes into its own. And by stages, the imagination reabsorbs the suffering nature world back into the light and love from which it had broken away. Burma writes, then the sting of death is broken and there rises in nature the other will of the Father, which he drew prior to nature in the mirror of the virgin wisdom, namely his heart of love, the desire of love, the kingdom of joy.
descriptions of the working of the, the descriptions of the working of the seven nature forms are found time and again in Burma's writings. And in 18th century England, much effort was expended in attempts to understand this complicated scheme. Some of you may know the illustrations by Dionysius Freya, which accompanied Law's translation of Burma. But Burma also, of course, related his thought to traditional Christian imagery, doing so gladly and with conviction. His only problem with Christianity was that it seemed to have lost touch with its own meaning. In the greatest part of the books of the divines, he writes in his book, The Three Principles of the Divine Essence, in the greatest part of the books of the divines, there is nothing but the history that such a thing has been done and that we should be regenerated in Christ. But what do I understand from hence? Nothing, but only the history and that such a thing ought to be done. Our divines say that men must not dare to search into the deep grounds of what God is. Men must not search nor curiously pry into the deity. In spite of the stresses and strains, Burma tried to relate his understanding of God to Christian doctrine. He often seeks to link his teachings to the Christian trinity. As we have seen, he calls the first principle, the will outwards into manifestation, the Father. The second, the return towards unity, the Son. And the third principle, the human condition, the Holy Spirit. The crucifixion is the clash of the outward and inward wills, the cross on which both nature and humanity suffer. At other times, he connects his teaching to the doctrine of the fall, both of Lucifer and of Adam. In his short work of the supersensual life, Burma has a dialogue between a disciple and his master in which he makes it clear that salvation lies in a change in our willing, an ending of the own will, and its replacement by what he calls the resigned will, or God's will. By this thou shalt come into that ground out of which all things are originated, and in which they subsist, the disciple is told. Pray tell me, dear master, where dwelleth it in man? Where man dwelleth not, there hath it its seat in man. Where is that in man, where man dwelleth not in himself? It is the resigned ground of a soul, to which nothing cleaveth. Where is the ground in any soul, to which there will nothing stick? It is the center of rest and motion in the resigned will. Nothing in all the world can enter into it, because the will is dead with Christ unto the world. Here it is, where man dwelleth not, and where no self abideth or can abide. O oh, where is this naked ground of the soul, void of all self? Tell me plainly, loving sir, where it is, and how it is to be found of me and entered into. There where the soul hath slain its own will, and willeth no more anything as from itself. Burma tells us that the result of this surrender of the own will and its replacement by God's will is a changed vision of the world. For knowledge is a function of being, and when our understanding of our own nature changes, the world also changes for us, and we see it with new eyes. For Burma, this changed vision of the world is Sophia, the virgin wisdom, the precious maiden of the wisdom of God. In a passage in his book, The Three Principles, he imagines her speaking these words. I am the light of the mind, I am the root's bride, 
but he has put on a rough coat. The root, of course, is the ungrund, the fundamental will from which all manifestation flows. And the rough coat that he has put on is the first principle or first will, the dark world of strife and suffering, the world as we see it now. The virgin wisdom continues, I will not lay myself in his arms until he puts that coat off and then I will rest eternally in his arms and adorn the root with my power and give him my beautiful form and espouse myself to him. This espousal is the transformed vision of the world, the great change in knowledge which comes with the denial of, the escape from, the own will, and its replacement by designed by and its replacement by resigned will or love. <clears throat> For in the last resort, love is nothing else than the denial of the own will and the joyful acceptance of God's will in its place. Perhaps the best trans, perhaps the best description of this state is found not in Burma's own words but in those of the English poet and divine Thomas Traherne, who probably knew of Burma through the Cambridge Platonists. The passage is a celebrated one, and many of you will know it already. The corn was orient and immortal wheat, which never should be reaped, nor was ever sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. The dust and stones of the street were as precious as gold, and young men glittering and sparkling angels. This for Burma was the great salvation, the gift of the virgin wisdom, the idea of which sustained his life and which he sought for others. Love is the true means by which the world is enjoyed, Traherne wrote, and again, the world is a mirror of infinite beauty, yet no man sees it. It is the same for Burma. As the individual nature drops away and the own will is transformed into God's will, the world is transformed and the half-dead angels, which are men and women, recover their true being, their right image. As a fair flower, he writes, grows out of the rough earth, which is not like the earth, but declares by its beauty the power of the earth and how it is mixed of good and evil. So also is every man who, out of the animal, wild, earthly nature and quality, is born again so as to become the right image of God. Thank you.